Okay, welcome everybody. So good to have you again for another session of our Nephrology Fellow Rounds. So today, certainly a bit of a shift, even though there have been not necessarily a theme or a path that we've been going with these rounds. We have been jumping around a bit, but um, you know, wanted to cover this article mostly just because I had come across it fairly recently and was pretty excited about the article and thought it was just an interesting thing to use as maybe some framework on how we look at uh, GN in, in our patients. And so this review article, obviously it was, was big, it was 19 pages, but there were lots of figures and some of these figures took up you know, whole pages. So it wasn't as brutal as what it certainly seems to be. But I thought the paper was interesting because it gave, it gave both very basic information and then very detailed information at the same time. I mean, the fact that there is a, number one, just a, anatomy of a glomerulus, how that needed to be essentially an entire page, means that they're presuming people don't know what a glomerulus is when they're reading this article, which is great. Um, the fact that they have a, um, a glossary, right, um, of all the different terms that are, are used throughout the manuscript is uh, interesting, um, helpful, I guess. Um, yeah, they have a glossary, which includes nephron and glomerulus, but then like April 1 and other things as well, too. So it was an interesting article because it, I think it presumed that you didn't know anything about GN, which is great, and then dives pretty deep into um, kind of a re-categorization uh, of the various pathologies and thinking about it more in terms of an etiologic uh, framework. So I thought that that would be an interesting way to just think more about our patients who have immune complex glomerular nephritis because you know, we really just kind of limit our diagnosis to immune complex GM. And in my experience, I rarely find a trigger for it even with infectious disease testing, it often comes up negative or they've had antibodies to Borrelia for years and years and years, and we still can't even definitively prove it. So I thought that this was just an interesting way to maybe think about the etiology from the, the immune system pathway differently. Because I think we're always, personally, I'm always thinking about it on the back end, like the complexes that are there, still working on trying to understand and wrap my brain around complement and how that could be activated compared to B cells and T cells. And I think this paper did a decent job of starting to tease out some of that information, um, at, least, at least for me overall. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, the first thing, I, I can't say I was really that familiar with any of these authors. I don't know, um, Rachel, Mary, Jess, if you guys have heard and familiar with these folks? No, nope, um, I just was going to say, I don't know who any of them are. Does it have their um, um, location? Like they're- uh, Yeah, they are, and they're all, a lot of them are European, so let's yeah, see. Yeah, it looks like um, Munich, Australia, um, the Italy. Roman the yeah, the Roman Nagy um, author sounds familiar like on a lot of papers, but I we, I, we don't know any personally. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's just interesting. Yeah, I would have imagined, you know, I could have thought of a bunch of other names for this. Not to at all um, say that these people aren't trustworthy, but they're, they weren't names that I that jumped to the forefront of my mind in terms of thinking of glomerular pathology in people. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and let's kind of dive into it. Um, so they obviously go through the overview of the glomerulus and what it does and what the pathologies might be and uh, they kind of introduce how you can have stimulation of the immune system from a lot of different pathways and how that can result in an aberrant response that the kidney is then implicated in damage, whether that's because the immune system is attacking things in situ 
or there are circulating immune factors that are leading to the kidneys becoming um, involved and affected one way or the other. So they, uh, let's see, what, what do I want to start with? Um, so I think one thing that is important that they, they didn't necessarily, I think they said it, but it wasn't maybe as explicitly stated as I thought it could be, or at least what I didn't get from it, is when we see our, our lesions, when we see the pattern and we get our diagnosis that um, on our kidney biopsies, what we're seeing is not the disease. And I think that this is something that took me a long time to really understand, that when we see membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, that is not a disease. When we see membranous nephropathy, that is not a disease. You are looking at the reaction pattern. You are looking at the response of the kidney. And there are many different things that can cause and NPGN. There are many different things that can cause membranous, mesangioproliferative, minimal change disease, glomerulosclerosis, that we're talking about the pathology, not a disease. But I think we look at that in much different terms. And maybe that's partly because we don't have a lot of the sophisticated ways to identify what the triggers might be, number one. Number two, we lack more refined treatment for many types of immune complex GN. Whether it's a membranous or a membranoproliferative pattern, many times we're probably going to turn to steroids and mycophenolate, maybe cyclophosphamide. Maybe we think about cyclosporin, even though um, Shelley Vaden's paper suggested it wasn't helpful, but that was from 1995 when we didn't even have proper biopsy evaluation of patients, number one. And number two, it was using Sandimune. It was using unmodified cyclosporin, which has totally different pharmacokinetics and bioavailability than cyclosporin modified. So we that, that study is unfortunately just dated that we really can't apply its results to a current uh, cyclosporin plan if we were to use it. So I, I think as we it starts to introduce some of these patterns that are here, that is something I think that uh, for me, and, and I don't have to certainly explain this to uh, Mary and Rachel and Jess, but for clinicians, that when we get back these reports, that is not a diagnosis. That is not a, uh, it is a diagnosis, it's not a disease. MPGN is not a disease. Now, do I list that as the patient's problem in their medical record? Yes, I do, because I don't know what their disease is. I know they have a new complex glomerulonephritis that results in a membranoproliferative pattern, but I don't know what that cause is in nearly every single case of a new complex gene. And I think if we stop with, I have a diagnosis, it's a membranous glomerulonephropathy, that is not the complete picture. That is identifying that there's immune activation and likely identifying a need for immunosuppression, but it's not identifying what the disease is. And if we always are saying, well, that's our diagnosis, we're done, then we're never going to advance this further. So everything we're talking about is reaction patterns, and it's not the disease. And that is a huge point that I think clinically we need to understand as we move forward to try to help us understand that we need to be looking for these triggers. We need to be finding the agent that has triggered that membranoproliferative response within the glomerulus. Not that that is the underlying disease. I don't know if anybody else had any comments or thoughts just on that kind of general concept. Um, so, so this is Rachel. Um, I raised my hand. I'm going to now lower my hand. But um, I think everything you said is spot on. And I think that the reason it has evolved this way is that we are 30 years behind, obviously, human medicine. Um, and we are using almost historical classification, or we were using almost historical classification systems that were published in old versions of their textbooks. 
So before the WSAVA project got initiated, we were still calling things type three MPGN and thinking that that was a disease. And we were publishing papers with a case report of a type three MPGN. And so when I was doing my fellowship at the med school, that was kind of as C3GN was starting to be recognized. And then, you know, over the course of that time, we realized C3GN actually has its own subcategories as well. Um, and so those things are all, you know, 10 years old in human medicine, and we are still kind of figuring out, do they actually exist in veterinary medicine as well? Um, so there are certain diseases that are quite classic in humans that cause glomerulonephritis pattern, and we just don't see in veterinary medicine. Um, and I'm assuming we will eventually be able to say there are certain diseases that happen in dogs and cats that just never happen in humans. Um, what we need are better serologic biomarkers for some of these diseases to see if they are comparable. Um, for example, C3 glomerulonephritis, you have a very specific complement um, uh, serology. And we don't even have a way to measure complement levels in dogs and cats. I can't find it anywhere. Um, and so, so there are certain times where it's just because we don't have the exact same um, overall uh, assays, um, it will be very hard for us to say whether lupus happens in dogs and cats, lupus nephritis, excuse me, happens in dogs and cats until we get those biomarkers. Um, and once we do have those biomarkers, then I think we will say, okay, this is the canine version of lupus nephritis. They don't have the ANA that we think about in humans, but they have all these other autoantibodies. And so we think that this is a model of lupus. Um, but I think it's just because nobody's nobody's writing the papers. And I think with your comment about Shelley's cyclosporin paper, because it exists, people think, think it's already been tried. So nobody does, nobody repeats the study with modern formulations of the drugs and with a better characterized cohort of patients. So you need to write those papers, JD. I'm on it. I'm on it. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. And because we're using terminology that is still outdated, it makes it more challenging when you are trying to really dive into what is known in people and try to apply it to your patients. And I think the classic scenario, which is not in this paper because this is talking about really immune mediated GN, but the classic example would be focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. You know, when we see FSGS on our patients, in our patients, um, it it is not it is not the typical disease that is there in people. So in people, you have they absolutely can get the reactive pattern of FSGS, and in some of those patients, what is driving it is this soluble permeability factor, which is not even completely well characterized, which is which is cool just because it's going to be characterized. So it, it's, you know, I reading back through all, a lot of these papers that we've gone through, you know, we've talked about, well, you know, they didn't know that this was TAMS horsefall mucoprotein, or they didn't know it was this, and now, now we understand. Like, we're living in a time where we don't know what the causative agent of FSGS is, but we will. But as far as we know, we haven't really seen dogs have that same type of phenotype where dogs with FSGS have this circulating permeability factor that tends to be very, very responsive to steroid therapy in people. So when you look at FSGS papers in humans, you're gonna see a lot of steroid trials and whatnot, which have not anecdotally been effective in our patients because they probably are having a completely different disease, even though the patterns look the same. And it makes it challenging to then apply translationally what's seen in humans to our patients when the patterns are not the disease, patterns are not the pathogenesis, patterns are not the etiology. And I think this this paper did a good idea of, of introducing that, but I, I really want to hit home on that being probably the most important take home thing period that I took from this paper. And I think to Rachel's point, you know, not having the ability to measure complement 
has allowed me to ignore most of what I learned in vet school about compliment. You know, I, I learned something, remember just barely enough to pass an exam, and then never really applied it clinically. You know, maybe talk about a little bit for intravascular IMHAs, talk about a whole lot more with glomerular disease because we can stain for compliment, but the, if I then take it further and say, okay, well, can I draw up on this whiteboard how a stimulus can lead to complement deposition within the glomerulus? I can't. I can't do it off the top of my head, and I can't do it to a sufficient level. So not having that be something that we're, we measure with diseases that makes me interpret it, remember it, and have it be part of the pathophysiology means that it's just not something that is going to be well understood in my brain. You know, I don't hold on to things well unless I'm constantly seeing it and, and reviewing it. So the lack of these assays not only prevent us from characterizing things, but also just allows us to skip the whole middle section, that we get to the end, that we have something that led to the immune system causing antigen antibody complexes being deposited in the kidney. The mechanism of that, eh, not so sure of it. The trigger of it, not sure what it is. There had to be some trigger. So presuming a trigger was there, we have no idea what it is. Something happens, and then we're left at the end. And um, we're probably missing a lot of opportunities to manage these patients differently or to find a trigger that might still be existent that maybe we can still minimize to help change the course of the disease. Or maybe not, but at this point, we certainly don't even know one way or the other. So, uh, and, that, and I think one one um, from a from a pathology standpoint, when I've lectured to this to people who are trained pathologists and board certified, and I have clarified that there are different uh, pathogenesis to get to, let's say, a membrane proliferative pattern. So both complement-mediated glomerulonephritis, which is a problem with the complement system, and you cannot remove regular deposits that would normally filter through a glomerulus, um, you start to actually make deposits of complement itself, and it has very, very few immunoglobulins in it. So it's a complement-mediated electron-dense deposit. We can see that on um, immunofluorescence, and we can also measure complement levels in the blood. You would treat that completely differently in a human because in a human you need to then interrupt the complement system. You need to interrupt the overactivation of the complement system. So it is very important for you to get the diagnosis correct in humans. We don't have complement system blockers in veterinary medicine yet. Um, but that's why there's a pl plenty of times where pathologists say, well, why would you care? It all looks the same on histology. Why do you care which one was making the deposit? And if we ever got to the point where we had personalized medicine and veterinary medicine, you would actually need to know, are these electron dense deposits made of immunoglobulins and the immunoglobulins are stimulating complement or all, are these immune deposits completely made of complement? So knocking down antibodies are really not gonna do anything. So it is important. It's just something where we don't have the methods yet. Right. And that mindset is completely unhelpful. So to say like, well, you know, what does it matter because we don't have those abilities to manage the patients differently is true today. But the goal is we want to refine these diseases. We will re refine our therapy so that that can be something that can happen. And yes, we don't have, you know, rituximab doesn't work in our patients, but they're working on a veterinary anti-CD20. So like, that therapy is in the works, and there are papers that have looked at it for cancer. So just to say that, well, we don't, those therapies don't exist is, is basically stopping any momentum that we can try to develop. Because when I read this paper, I am pumped. I am psyched. I want to measure curl and NEF1, and APO1, and all these antibodies that that we can possibly can to try to just see what shakes out and what might be the some of the the triggers for these patients and I mean it's wide open for us we just need 
money and time and the ability to start looking at this, but it's an untapped area that could absolutely develop into very directed therapies. And presuming that there isn't going to be just means that we're, we're never, we're never going to get it. You know, we're, we're never going to understand. We're never going to advance medicine if we just are stuck saying, well, we don't have that option now. So why do anything? Well, because let's, let's do it tomorrow. Let's do it the day after that. Let's, let's, let's make it happen. That's, that's soapboxing for me. I wish I would say that I'm, that's the last soapbox, but you'll probably, probably hear <laughs> me yelling from the soapbox continually throughout today. Uh, okay, let me see what I had in terms of just notes that I wrote, pattern, is maybe pathology, um, just to remind myself of what we see with posse immune since we don't see it too often. Uh, and I, so I did like this quote here that pathology lesion-based GN categories, which is really how we look at things, membranoproliferative, membranous, mesangioproliferative, often do not dissect the diversity of the underlying immunologic disorders, which require different treatments. And hence, treatments based upon those categories may result in many non-responders. And this is so classic. How many GN patients do we have that we put them on pred and, and mycophenolate and they don't get better. Is that because their disease is too advanced? Sure, plenty of times. Is it because we're not targeting the correct immunologic pathway? I think absolutely. And do we need to try a different drug? Of course, but for some of those patients, you give them a month of mycophenolate, two months of mycophenolate before you might say that they're not getting better, that would be two months of active disease that you lost time and the ability to manage them. So being able to know from the beginning, well, this is the suspected immunologic etiology that's going to best be responsive to cytoxin, to cyclosporin, to veterinary rituximab, to some type of anti-complement therapy that hopefully will be developed. So it will... You know, the lack of response is not, it, it, we, we see it all the time, and, and it's not always explained easily just due to the chronicity of the lesions that we see on biopsy. And a lot of that's probably because our therapy is not correct. <laughs> and, and if you think about 90 plus percent of all of our immune complex GNs likely being managed with mycophenolate, because that's what the WSABA group recommended to get more experience and the side effect profile, and I, it's great, we had to start somewhere. But if you look at human medicine, that is never the case. It's never that you have, you know, even amongst like membranous, it's not everyone gets this. There are, uh, there are multiple paths of therapy that are there that um, we, should, we should be reminded of when we are treating these patients and when we don't have a clinical response, it might be that yes, they have a immune complex GN, but our therapy might be inhibiting the complete wrong aspect of the immune system and maybe that's why they're not responding. So this paper put forth five categories of um, basically an, an immune-mediated glomerulonephritis. We'll, we'll call it that. And I thought that it was an interesting way to categorize things because it's not just relying on, it's the categorized, the categories are based upon their pathogenesis, not their reactive pattern. So some reactive patterns might be present in multiple different categories, but the categorization is based upon the mechanism, which actually makes a lot more sense to then get you closer to understanding what the trigger is, as well as how might you need to treat it. So the five they came up with, the first one is secondary to infection. And this is where the glomeruli are involved, um, either via humoral or cellular um, mediated mechanisms. I'm gonna skip past the beautiful cartoon of the glomerulus because I think we, I think we've all got that pretty well, but, um, it's a great picture if you need one, 
Um, so the infectious cause, um, those patients are often just treated with therapy to address the infection. And then when the infection is gone, then you will have no, uh, you will not have any further stimulation in the immune system and the GN will recover without any additional treatment. The second category is autoimmune glomerulonephritis. And those are, um, that's an immune response against autoantigens. And so this is where we're going to have uh, patients who develop antibodies against nephrin, against curl one against APOL1, against these, uh, these antigens within the kidney themselves. It also could be antigens that are elsewhere in the body, and the, you could have a circulating antigen-antibody complex that becomes deposited. So they're not all renal antigens, but it is a self-antigen that's causing it. The third one, which we don't see obviously very commonly at all in dogs, and I think um, maybe rarely, we really have to pull those cases, but the third one is all alloimmune GN, which is where we have a kidney transplant scenario, and there is a mismatch between donor immunity, uh, recipient immunity against the donor tissue, and then much less commonly the opposite, graft versus host. Uh, we obviously do kidney transplants in cats. Many of those cats can have both acute and chronic rejection. I don't think we have a lot of work into the categorization of that. I think a lot of those cats don't get repeat or kidney biopsies, period, when they're having an acute rejection. Um, I think it's more maybe when they pass away, we might get kidney tissue from them. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, but I, I feel like we don't get a lot of, I mean, we get it occasionally, but we probably don't have a ton of graft biopsies in our patients that are having rejection. Yeah, we we get like one, maybe a year. Um, and uh, usually it's not necessarily from concern for rejection, but um, just whether or not there was necrosis of the graft um, from, you know, original problems of the transplant. And I, I assume that Penn is collecting tissues at autopsy when people consent for autopsy at the end. Um, I don't, they never submit them to us. Um, so maybe there is a cohort of animals that are being kept at a vet school somewhere. Um, that would be really interesting for us to look at to see if there is, um, you know, transplant rejection. Um, but they don't come to, it's probably because they, they assume that Texas A&M will be too, the IVRPS will be too expensive, but obviously we could work out a situation. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe they still think it's going to be too slow. I mean, that's a common thing that we hear from clinicians all the time, that the patients are either dead or they're better by the time you get the biopsy, which is garbage. Um, but, oh yeah, but even just like autopsy from like whenever it's like they don't have nothing yeah. to treat, but now we're we're at autopsy. Sorry, I have um, house cleaners vacuuming and my dogs are going a little crazy. So, <laughs> um, so that's the third category, alloimmune GM, which I think happens likely in our patients, but we are going to have very little data for that. Fourth is autoinflammatory GM, and these are genetic errors of immunity. And this is really interesting in people because these are where you have, um, you can get excellent, excellent responses in these patients as long as you break what their autoimmunity is related to. So if you can figure out what the target is and you can stop that process, these patients can do very, very well. And then the fifth category is the monoclonal gammopathy like GNs, which are going to be depositions of monoclonal immunoglobulins within the kidney and those patients are the ones that are it's going to be driven mostly by b cells and plasma cells so something like ritux is going to be the, the therapy of choice for a person which which we don't have readily available to us so these are the five categories of immune mediated glomerulonephritis that are proposed and I, I thought this was a 
a reasonable way of, of categorizing things. Uh, I don't know what everybody else thought in terms of this, or if um, if are you guys seeing this at all in med, in the, the med schools in terms of ways that it it biopsies are starting to get reported or or looking at? Is this more just uh, an article that's recommending something, or is this a frame shift that you guys are starting to see amongst your MD colleagues? Um, yeah, so oftentimes when we are reviewing cases for rounds um, at the at OSU uh, med school, um, they will, at the, to their best of their ability, try to give you infection associated blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, so that the, that the nephrologist will have the cause in the diagnostic line um, and then kind of give the pattern. So for example, lupus nephritis, which is one of our autoimmune GNs, uh, they have to have a diagnosis of lupus first before we can diagnose lupus nephritis. Um, but then lupus itself can give multiple different patterns. It can give a membranous pattern. It can give a mesangioproliferative pattern. It can give a membranoproliferative pattern. It can give a crescentic pattern. It can give a sclerotic pattern. So they would say lupus nephritis with, and then they would give the pattern. Um, the pattern itself does have prognostic information because if you have a lot of crescents, you're going to do worse. If you're all scarred, you're going to do worse. So having the pattern in that diagnostic line helps the nephrologist, but then having the etiology tells them kind of how they're going to do their treatment. Um, so uh, both of those, anything they can do where they have the diagnostic line um, as far as cause um, which is, is, is going to be there. And then there's times where they don't have that information um, to correctly categorize it into this kind of group, um, like an infection associated GN. Um, and they're not really sure, but they think, oh, maybe this patient has an abscess somewhere. They'll just talk about the pattern and then their discussion, they'll say, these are the you know things that we would think for this type of pattern that it looked for an infection somewhere. Um, you know, even if you didn't find something on your original scan, maybe it's, you know, an endocarditis that you didn't look for because you didn't do a transesophageal EEG or whatever, um, not EEG, but that the uh, echo. Um, so, so they'll say, look harder for a, uh, look, look harder for an, a, a, a region of infection. Um, but that would go more in their comments. But yeah, th this is, this is uh, typical for what we yeah. diagnose. Cool. So it's nice to see that it's actually getting some permanence rather than just a new academic categorization. So let's dive into some of these categories. So the infection-related GN, they list a lot of the different causes, and a lot of them are post-viral infection, which might be one reason that we might not see this very commonly in our patients. Um, they see, see with uh, post-streptococcal infections, which we occasionally will see strep UTIs, and then rarely it's a strep hepatitis, or you know, it's just not an infection that's very common at all in our patients. But when we look at the list of things that are there, you know, that we do have some things like parvovirus and coronavirus, which our patients certainly can be affected by, but we just are lucky that we don't have a lot of viral disease, or even that what we do, like tons of parvo, but we're just not, we're not necessarily seeing that they're developing GN, but are we looking for it? You know, maybe it's, it's probably not going to be at the time that they're sick and they're having diarrhea and they're lupopenic in the hospital when they were diagnosed, but it could be within the next few months. And are we keeping up with them? Are we checking urines? Are we keeping close tabs on those patients? To be honest, probably not. You know, if their white cell count rebounds, you're probably not going to do much additional blood work once their total proteins are better too. So again, maybe this is occurring and we're just missing it. But there, there weren't a lot of triggers on this big list that I thought were very common diseases that we see. I thought what was interesting is that while some of those infections, and you think of all these different viruses, most of those are probably going to be the immune response to the virus wherever it sources in the lungs, in the liver, uh, in the upper respiratory tract, wherever. And then you're likely going to have circulating immune complexes that will be positive. But you can also have in situ complexes. And they talk about how with group 
A, beta hemolytic strips, their antigens can attach to the glomerular endothelial cells. So you'll have the antigen that gets trapped there, and then you'll have the antibodies that will form around that trapped antigen. So it's not the circulating antigen antibody complex that gets stuck in the glomerulus, it's the antigen that gets stuck, and then in situ formation of complexes around it, which is just kind of an interesting uh, thing that we can see with that. Uh, so they talk a little bit about how the strep toxins can can bind, which very interesting, but I, again, I haven't seen a post-strep um, case of, of GN. Again, it's very uncommon that we see strep, period. And then the other pathway would be circulating immune complexes, and this would be with some systemic disorder. And we certainly worry about this maybe being the trigger, and if Borreliosis is a trigger for immune complex GM, then presumably, since we have several papers that have shown that dogs with presumptive Lyme-associated nephropathy don't have an abundance of spirochetes within their kidneys, that that is going to be either formation of circulating antigen antibody complexes that become deposited or who say it's not something like strep, where you have an antigen that becomes trapped within the glomerulus and then that leads to formation. Or this patient has had antibodies to Borrelia for years and years and years because they get exposed in their backyard every summer and the pathology that we're seeing is 100% unrelated to the fact that they have a positive Lyme type, which is the real truth that <laughs> Even with a biopsy in a dog that's Lyme positive, we really cannot still say that those two are intimately related, that, that having a high C6 antibody level means anything for what's happening in the kidney. It, it could be completely different antibodies, completely different antigen that's targeting things. So it could be related, it could be unrelated, and that's probably one of our at least most well-known presumptive infection-related GN, and that's not even completely substantiated. In my and I think it's interesting. Is so I I have an index index of suspicion if I know they've had tick exposure. I don't necessarily need it to be Lyme, but if they've had tick exposure from any of the tick-borne diseases, and I see something that I'm like, ah, that might be immune complex based on the histology and I would go ahead and start treating and wait, you know, while we're waiting for the EM and immunofluorescence, I think it would be reasonable to cheat, treat because we know we have a history of some type of tick-borne disease, tick, tick exposure, I should even say, and then what I'm seeing in histology. That is, tick-borne disease is not something that ever jumps to the mind of an MD when they're thinking about GN. Like, they do not like when there's been cases where they're like looking at a biopsy we'll be looking at it from a patient that moved from colorado had rocky mountain spotted fever in colorado and i'll be like well yeah they could have this could be from their tick exposure and they'll the mds will just go oh yeah i hadn't thought of that um now what now it's really hard for them to prove too that that's what was the initiating factor because it's just as much as people get tick-borne disease they don't actually get glomerulonephritis from it Except for, have you guys all been seeing like Pfizer's developing a drug for, because they say Lyme can be in teenagers that are around dogs. There's like, I'm getting it like a whole bunch of posts on Instagram about there's a new study with Pfizer looking at Lyme disease in, in teenage kids, teenagers and young adults that are near dogs that also have Lyme disease. And what, and I'm like, I don't know what their manifestation of Lyme would be, but I guess they're, I mean, Pfizer's recruiting people for a clinical trial for it. I thought it was interesting. So maybe it, Maybe those are going to be glomerulonephritis. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, it's been a while it's, since I've done the lit search, but as of the last couple of years ago, the last time I gave this type of lecture, you know, if you had a Lyme associated glomerulopathy in a person, it was still a case report. You know, I think as of a couple of years yep, ago, I think exactly. there were eight cases that had been published. And if you think about all the thousands and thousands of people that are diagnosed with Lyme disease every year. It, 
it has always made me nervous that we're just jumping to this diagnosis of Lyme associated nephropathy in our patients without really being confident. I agree. Rachel, Rachel, was the drug for the dog or for the teenager? Uh, it was enrolled to, it was a uh, recruitment for teenagers. You know, okay, so it's, for, it's it's a drug to give to, the, okay. Yeah, to right. people, but it, it literally is kind of one of those things where it's, I, I clicked on it once, so now I keep, keep getting more ads, I'll send it to you guys, but um, okay. it's, you know, it literally says dogs can give your teenagers Lyme disease, please enroll in the study. Oh, great, and kill all your dogs, that's awesome. Oh. So it goes through some of the pathogenesis of how pathogens, and a lot of these are viral infections on how they can trigger uh, immune activation within the glomeruli, and we'll kind of skim through that. Uh, and then they go through the targets for immunotherapy and benefits of corticosteroids or other immunosuppressive drugs to limit irreversible damage and in infection-related GM remains uncertain, which is I think what we see certainly in our patients that we get the diagnosis of immune complex GN, we're hopeful that we might have an opportunity to reverse some of their disease, but it's still a guarded prognosis whether that will be the case. And they talk about some therapies specifically where interferons are uh, binding to and targeting the APL1 antigen and being a major pathway of the glomerulonephritis, that these drugs, enaxaplin and baricitinib, are being yeah, still evaluated in clinical trials. So again, the area where they might have a more targeted ability to break the immunopathogenesis on what leads to that pattern. Um, so maybe there could be things like this. And, for some of these drugs, they are going to be very, very specific to the human molecular targets, and depending upon the homology, they might not be effective in dogs or cats, but some of them might be. So we'll just have to kind of take it, take it as they come, for sure. Um, okay, uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so we'll keep going through things. So autoimmune GN, this is where we have an adaptive immune response against self antigens that localize to the kidney. Um, or are expressed systemically. And the extra renal antigens can become either, again, can have an antigen that gets trapped, or you have a circulating antigen antibody complex that can become deposited within the GBM that can lead to that further in situ complex formation. And uh, so. They have uh, talk about their these very nephr nephritogenic autoantibodies that are there, and then depending upon the titers, you can have both acute GN or chronic and slowly progressive GN. So, depending upon the, I guess the level of activation in the immune system, these patients can present with your acute PLNs that are rapidly progressively. Uh, deteriorating kidney function. What I think of in my head is a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which is what I see clinically, which is not the same thing in RPGN from a pathology perspective in people. That's a crescentic disease, which I, even those patients that clinically have rapidly progressive decline in GFR because of their immune complex GN, when we biopsy them, Crescents are not a common feature that we see, but I, clinically we have those that are rapidly progressive, circulating, circuit, circling the drain that are gonna die if you don't do anything, still could die if you do everything. And those that are more chronic and, um, you know, like the case that was discussed on the ASD and u listserv, you know, a patient with months and months of proteinuria, but progressive proteinuria, progressive decline in kidney function, hypoalbuminemia, that also could 100% be an immune-mediated process. So it, autoimmune disorders are not necessarily known for always giving one speed or another. I think that when they are acute 
they're a little bit easier to have a good presumption. And many of those cases with an acute AKI, acute clinical decompensation, we think it's from glomerular disease, the vast majority of those have turned out to be immune complex GM in those patients that have biopsy. Rarely we'll see something like an amyloid where it's probably more of an acute on chronic and we dig through the history and there's more evidence of chronic disease that's there. But in the vast majority of those patients we biopsy, they come back immune complex and we'll end up immunosuppressing them right away. Uh, the ones that are slower are harder. It's harder to know, you know, is this patient going to have glomerular sclerosis or does it have chronic immune complex GN? That's also probably causing some degree of sclerosis as well now, and, and that's really where, where you need the, the biopsy to be able to tell that as well. Too. Uh, they talk a little bit about IgA nephropathy here. Uh, we do see IgA nephropathy in our patients, not very commonly. We probably have, we talked about it a while ago, but we might have maybe five cases or so. I know I have one. Uh, and, but so we, we see it, but it's not a, a common thing. But this disease, it's IgA from the gut that is triggering uh, systemic production of antibodies that are then deposited uh, within the GI tract. And and I so, do want to say that for lot for IgA, it is the most prevalent cause of glomerulonephritis in humans, and that's because they have a different type of IgA than dogs have, they make a different, they make two different antibodies, two different immunoglobulins. And some of them are poorly, sh sugars are added incorrectly. And so because the sugars are added incorrectly, it exposes a part of the immunoglobulin that then IgG binds to. I'm sure there are also IgA human patients which have just the stuff from the gut or whatever, but the more common, and the reason it is so common in humans is because they're making defective IgA. And dogs just don't have that type of production of IgA. They don't, they make a, they make a different version. And even if they made the same version, it's not that we don't, we, they, they apparently make the sugars in the correct way. So I, I think that's what's annoying about this stuff is that if we're talking about that, we're talking about measuring an immunoglobulin. But the immunoglobulin could be produced in the correct way. It's just whether or not the sugars were added in the correct way. So now we've got to like measure galactosate, whatever, galactosylated immunoglobulin. So it's so complex <laughs> that, that it's really hard for us to say definitively what the cause of many of these diseases until we get a cohort of a million people or a million dogs, excuse me, that have a similar phenotype and then say, well, what was wrong about their transcriptomics or their proteomics or their lipomics? What was the difference? Yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> you have more positivity, but you're just a very positive person, JD, so. Positively positive, you know? <laughs> um, this is breaking things up a little bit, but I, I wasn't sure what you guys thought. I didn't necessarily think that the while the lesion pattern, which is you know, what we often think of as historically our diagnoses, FSGS, normal change disease, MPGN, proliferative, the structures that I injured are made sense to me. Um, but I didn't necessarily agree with what with their categorizations for the chronicity. I think that um, for MPGN, saying it's acute, we see plenty of MPGN patterns that have lots of sclerosis that it appears to be a more chronic disease and the history also fits with that as well too. So I didn't necessarily agree with feeling I could be confident in the chronicity of this table. So I would kind of just take that off personally. I don't know if anybody yeah, else. Yeah, I think a lot more would fit into variable as opposed to what they have, like a lot of them are variable. And I think a lot of this is also too when humans would probably be biopsied for these lesions because humans usually tend to know that they're sick and detectable for proceed to biopsy um, in industrialized countries. <laughs> um, so, yes. uh, uh, so yeah, I think a lot of those end up being, uh, being quote unquote variable, except for the stuff that's like the glomerulus sclerosis, the tubular artery interstitial fibrosis, that's all chronic. Um, 
Okay, they gave some beautiful images, which I, I, I unfortunately, I think let's let's skip through unless unless any of you guys saw something particular that you wanted to to point out. But clearly, we're we're familiar with the patterns that we see. Um, it was really not the point of this. Um, they talk about um, anca nephritis and lupus nephritis here, which again are things that we don't necessarily have well understood in veterinary medicine, partly because of our ability to measure these various things that are present. Um, going into more the, the pathogenesis of anca nephritis, of C3 glomerulopathy. Uh, oh, and how cool it is so that they actually have complement blocking antibodies, eculism. Uh, eculizumab is one of the ones that are used in people and so so really finely tuned therapies which are just totally different than throwing steroids and mycophenolia. Um, what used to be called good pastures disease which is a, um, an immune mediated attack against the uh, collagen within the basal membrane of the glomeruli and the tip of the lungs but could be other tissues as well too. Um, generally against the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen. So again, just giving different ways of, uh, of targets, essentially, of the immune system that's attacking itself, the, the body. Um, I like this table too. So they gave, the, here are five categories that are present, and they summed it up with very quickly their pathogenesis and what the therapy was. But then what I thought was really interesting and exciting about what we can continue to look at are the immunophenotyping that's there. And that's obviously from looking at kidney tissues, but even more so looking at some serologic markers, because that's probably the, the goal, you know, the end goal. If we can find more either serologic or urinary markers that can tell us with a relatively high level of confidence what the pathology might be, then we're going to not only have more tools that we can use for our diagnostics, but maybe have better directed care for patients that a biopsy is just not something that their their family, their owners are going to allow us to do. And we wish we could biopsy more patients. And this these other markers are ways that we can get more information upon it, which I, I thought was interesting. In terms of the reaction patterns, this I thought is another big point too. When you look at these things that we see, mesangio proliferative GM, well, you can see that with every category of disease that's there, membranous, everything essentially except from the auto-inflammatory gene, membrane proliferative, everything. So here's where here's that disconnect, right? We get that histologic diagnosis, and we think that that's our disease. That's not true. It can be seen with any one of these pathways of immune system activation, we need to keep working. We need to keep looking at what these targets might be, what might what the triggers might be. The problem is, as we've said, lack of testing that's available, things that are expensive. We're not, we don't have insurance that's going to pay for hundreds and hundreds of dollars for infectious disease testing. To be honest, the way that I practice, I tend to get the patients, biopsy them, and then if they come back immune complex GN, I'm going to then come back around and do more infectious disease related testing and things like that. And which is a little bit different than what the, uh, the WSABA consensus guideline says. They kind of say biopsy should be done after you've done all that stuff. But the problem for me is that even if I find a antibody to some infectious disease, I don't know if that's the trigger and treating for that infection might not do anything. The classic case is, is Lyme. You know, all these dogs that are Lyme positive, just put them on doxycycline, they will not get better if they are prothera. They're not going to get better, they will die unless you immunosuppress them. So I tend not to spend hundreds, if not more than $1,000 on infectious disease testing unless I get a biopsy that comes back and says, this is a new complex we need and you should then maybe look at these triggers. Otherwise, I'd rather put that thousand dollars towards the biopsy, so I could say, oh, it's it's amyloid. 
there's no reason I need to spend $800 on an infectious disease panel because that's not the trigger for me. Let's save that money and let's, not that we have a lot of other great options for amyloid, but at least we're not spending that money that we don't have to spend. So again, another take, uh, big take home point is the, uh, the reaction patterns being essentially there for most, if not all, of those various types of categorizations of immune system activation. They give uh, targets here, which uh, th these are basically the blood tests that um, Rachel was alluding to. So anti-PLAR, um, anti-nephrine, anti-NL1. These are all blood tests that can be done in people. Um, maybe not every single one of these things, but the vast majority, they have a serologic test. There might be some that would be a urine test as well, too. Certainly some of these are going to have more specific antibody staining within kidney tissue as well. But these are serologic panels that can be done that help allow clinicians to determine if it's active or inactive, and they can target therapy according to what the serology might be. And it's for me, this is just exciting because this is where we could be. And I, I hope that we can get there. We certainly have a lot of brain power and a lot of smart people that can do it. We just need more grants <laughs> and time to do it for sure. Um, okay, we're coming to the very end. Uh, let me just see if we have, there are many other major things. Uh, oh, uh, I asked myself a question. Have you seen this in dog? What's that? Antibodies against, um, oh, th these tiny dust-like IgG deposits, which occur due to antibodies binding to components of the slit diaphragm. Uh, and Rachel, I wasn't sure, have we seen these tiny, what's described as dust-like IgG deposits that are there? I think this is one of those lesions that is, you need to see it on frozen tissue rather than, than fresh fixed tissue, but is that something that you guys have encountered? No, and they that so using convocal is a higher level of a um, resolution because you kind of go through a a, G, a z axis as well, and we only use that befluorescence. Um, and even in at UNC and OSU, nobody would nobody does this routinely um, to to use this. It would be more for research. Gotcha. Um, they talk about autoimmune disorders where something like plasma exchange to get rid of those antibodies could be there. And then the endopeptidase, emlifidase, uh, can be used, which I had never heard of before. But that's an IgG-specific protease. And it's approved in Europe. I don't know if it's approved here in the U.S., but uh, I think it's approved for treating uh, kidney transplant uh, rejection. But it cleaves IgG. Um, and it's a way to essentially inactivate IgG. So I thought that that was a very cool uh, therapeutic approach. Uh, this figure I thought was great, figure three, in ter terms of just putting cartoons to the different pathologies of how we can get to uh, GN. Uh, it, is, it is cool. I, we, we don't really have time to go through all of the different aspects of it. Autoimmune GN, I don't think we can really cover that too much, both all as well because we don't have the ability to uh, diagnose this as much. We don't do a lot of transplants, so it's not something we're going to see very often. Um, and what else do we got? Oh, here, all these different drugs that are, um, that are being investigated. We can only hope that. They might cross track with dogs and cats and also not be ridiculously expensive. I doubt <laughs> we'll find many drugs that will fit with both of those things. And then the last one is this auto inflammatory disorder, and that's from inborn errors of immunity. And these are the patients that can do very, very well, the humans that can do very, very well when that target is identified and they have a very specific uh, treatment to break their cycle of attacking themselves, essentially. Uh, so a disease that's not very well understood in veterinary medicine, but is there. And then the last one is the monoclonal one. 
So this is going to be patients who are going to have monoclonal uh, deposition of immunoglobulins. Um, and most of that is either going to, so it's going to be either B cell or plasma cells that are causing too much. And it could be related to neoplasia or it's just a benign proliferation of these things. And we get this monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance, MGRS is what it's called. And that's where we have, it's not cancer, but these, um, these abnormal B cells are producing these antibodies that get deposited then in the kidney. And um, this, we've seen patients who have had a hyperglobulinemia that we dialyzed, that we could not get under control. And we've had bone marrows, we've had aspirates and biopsies of organs that have failed to show any cancer. So I think we have seen some of these in very, very rare cases, but I, I can't say we got any clinical remission in our patient. We essentially dialyzed it and, until, it, until we stopped, but uh, it did not respond to immunosuppression overall. So again, things that are there, but maybe we're not using the right therapy. You're looking at what will be done for plasma cells, it's going to be using rituximab, which doesn't work in veterinary medicine, but maybe our own anti-CD20 is in the, the pathway, or other CD38 antibodies, which I don't think they have. Um, so that, that's about all I had today. I mean, I had a lot more. Um, it's a big paper. And hopefully everyone read it and um, was excited about future pathways that we might have in veterinary medicine to try to understand some things. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, we're a couple minutes over, but I can we can open it up. If anybody have any questions or comments, as usual, I end up kind of still on the show, but anybody have anything that they wanted to share, questions you have, um, now's a good chance to bring them up. Um, I just want to make sure you were recording this whole thing, right, JD? Yeah, yeah, okay. it's recorded. It'll get posted on the. Okay, I just want to make sure because button. I was seeing the button wasn't even lit up, but I was making sure. Um, and then also, um, the the goal I can see from a person who looks at a lot of kidneys is to correctly diagnose them then roll them into a study because we have people who are now true veterinary nephrologists that can run a nephrology center and then make sure that the drug you're putting them on makes sense for the disease. So trying microphenolate on a whole bunch of dogs that you buy, you have not biopsied and don't know actually just have a podocyte problem and not an immunoglobulin mediated problem is, is going to show that microphenolate is not a successful drug. So, and I'm very excited that the nephrology, um, nephro-urology uh, um, system exists now for training, but we also just need to make sure that we have centers of excellence that can then advise another small, maybe a, even a tertiary center to, to, to enroll patients so that we know that the right drug is being given to the right disease. Um, and then also develop drugs that actually hit the canine version of what we think is going on as opposed to just trying to use human drugs um, uh, is uh, very helpful. But um, I, I think this is a, um, I mean, I, I obviously skimmed the paper because a lot of it was stuff that was fairly well known to me. Um, but I think it is a very good way to kind of plan out how diagnoses work in human medicine and human nephropathology. Um, and then, and why you would actually take the time to figure out the correct diagnosis because the, the, the treatment is, is completely different depending on the diseases. Um, but there's lesions that I've seen in dogs that have never been seen in humans. So it, it, that's going to, it's going to be something we figure out that eventually dogs just have their own kidney diseases. Yep. And cats too. You know, we, uh, we, we see. Cats, cats too. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, cats are still an open book in terms of what they might have. And even though they tend to have a maybe a better response to mycophenolate than all immune complex dogs do, uh, that's we, we can probably count on 
you know, one tenth of all the dogs I treat for glomerular disease, I'm treating a cat for glomerular disease. It's just far, far less common. So um, still plenty of opportunities there for learning more and, and, and helping, helping them out as well. So, yep, yeah, hopefully the, with the advent of the college, we'll have easier ability to do some multi-center studies and really uh, support the development of people that have heard all of these things and are excited to learn more. I think going back to one of your earlier comments, Rachel, I remember being at, uh, during my residency at Wisconsin, and there was a kidney transplant cat that died. I wasn't involved in, in its care, so I don't know many of the details. But I remember it was being shown at necropsy rounds, and I was ta asking the pathologist if there would be, you know, are, are we going to look? Is there any chance the cat had progressive kidney disease and that's why it would, it would die like, does this cat have a uh, calcineurin inhibitor nephropathy is that something that that we're looking for and the pathologist said what's calcineurin inhibitor nephropathy so you know we, we don't we're never going to diagnose things if we don't know that they even exist and we don't know that they're going to exist unless we're starting to look and dive into the human literature and the human knowledge and understanding how dogs and cats act like and act dissimilarly to them. So it's really exciting that our college can start to generate that enthusiasm and help train people that are going to break the mold and start to look in other places that we can advance our understanding even more. And I, I think, so what I get afraid of, JD, and this is going to be my soapbox and then I'll stop because I have to eat lunch at some point, but We've obviously put a lot of data out there that you need a specialist and you need electron microscopy at the minimum to make sure you're accurate for certain diseases. Now, amyloid, you don't need it, but for certain diseases, you need EM to prove that there's deposits there. And I get worried that because the, the Atlas exists and there are a lot of pathologists that work at Antec or IDEX or whatever that are plowing through cases, and there's people who can't, and I get it, people can't spend the money. That's, but I feel that some pathologists are kind of flipping through our atlas and saying, oh, this one glomerulus matches this one picture in this one book. And therefore, and we've seen it, we've gotten second opinions from animals where they, they the, the, the non-trained, non-nephropathologist has given the wrong diagnosis. They went down the wrong route. And then when the animal eventually was euthanized, the clinician has sent us the kidney and we're like, no, that was actually completely wrong. And from a research interest, we've been able to do electron microscopy to prove that we're right. But I worry that because we are disseminating this information and people still don't really understand why you would spend the extra money and also not really communicating to the owner that, yeah, we're giving you a pattern, but that doesn't tell you etiology. It doesn't tell you the best treatment. Um, that we might actually be doing a disservice. Um, I know we're not, but it, it, it kind of upsets me that sometimes people are just using the atlas, flipping through it, and then, uh, and then saying, well, my, I have one single glomerulus in this entire specimen that matches that one, so it must be this disease. Right. Yeah, and I think that comes to the clinical training, too, that we need to have more of the clinicians that are actually obtaining the biopsies understand why they don't want to send it to their regular commercial diagnostic lab because they're not going to get even an accurate pattern <laughs> that's going to be shown, let alone the actual discussions on what the pathogenesis might be, but they're not even going to get a, a pattern that's accurate. So, all things to continue to work on and improve in our field, but we're getting there. We have pathways are being created, and we have nowhere but up to go. So. And, and think of how, I mean, I don't want to be like, like my gray hair is showing, but think of how far we've come, right? I mean, when I was an intern, which I get, granted, Reagan was in office, but when I was an intern, we were told, you know, immunosuppression does nothing for proteinuric animals. They're all dead within five months. That was like, Bob's your uncle, that was it. And I mean, we've gone from where we were to where we are. I remember trying to biopsy a, a 
dog when I was in my first year of my residency and everybody thought I was crazy because there's no reason to look at that. And we biopsied it and I took it over to the nephrologist at the med school in Minnesota and they read it out and, and then everybody's like, well, no, you can't trust any of that because they don't know what they're doing. It's a dog kidney. I'm like, granted, but it's better than, you know, here's a small bag of KD. Good luck. Right. Yeah, that's so, very true. We've come, yeah, so I just, I mean, we've come so far. We've got a long way to go, but I think we've got the momentum now and we're going to get there. I mean, like every time we have renal pathology rounds or every time we have any discussion, like I learn something new every time. Yeah. Sorry. I just. No, it's, it's a good point. It's a good point, Sherry. We're, it's a process and we're, I, I think we have more momentum now than we've had previously, which is, uh, which is awesome. Um, and, let, let's build on it. I think we've got a lot of great people in our community that uh, are fun to work with and super smart. So it's a good time. It's a good time to be in veterinary nephrology for sure. Oh, All right. Man. I gave everybody far too long over the time period. Um, I will go ahead and post this recording to the website. And then I need to look at the schedule to see if next month's will be during renal week or not. But uh, if not, I'll come up with a... Uh, another article, send it out to everybody, and I'll send everybody an email when this is posted on the website as well, too. So thanks, everybody, for joining in. Always so good to talk to Great you all. Job. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Yep, I'll see you guys soon.